let's introduce some important families of continuous random variables. So this is building off the idea that we had in the discrete random variable case that it's useful to define some families and derive things like their PDFs, their CDFs, their means, their variances, and so on, so that we don't have to redo those calculations every time we encounter something with the same underlying distribution. Okay, so we already saw that that's really useful. Let's do the same thing in the continuous case. We'll start with the easiest one of these, that's the uniform random variable. So x is a uniform AB random variable if it has the following PDF. So it starts at A and it goes to B and it's of height one, mi one over B minus A. Okay, so it's just a box of height one over B minus A from A to B. Okay, and this is the analog of a discrete uniform random variable, except now it takes values on the interval of the real line between a and b, okay, rather than the integers between the values that we had before. So it's a little different, but you know, at a you know, when if you're squinting, it's basically the same. Okay. Um, what's the CDF? Well we've worked with CDFs like this before. So it's going to be zero for a while and then it's going to have um, an offset and a slope. So let's just look at the picture here. So the slope is going to be one over b minus a which makes sense since the derivative, the PDF, tells us that it has value one over b minus a. And it's gonna be offset over to a, so it's gonna start going up at a, it's gonna continue going up until it hits b, and then flatten back out and stay at one, okay? The mean is just gonna be directly in the center, so it's gonna be a plus b over two. And the variance is something that's a little bit trickier to guess, it's b minus a squared over 12. And this over 12, we kind of remember from the discrete uniform case as well. So what's the interpretation? Well, it's equally likely to take any value between A and B, but now it's continuous. And the application we typically see this in might be something like measurement noise or uncertainty for a continuous random variable for which we only have a bounded range, right? So like maybe I just have something that I believe lies between one and three. I don't know much more than that. So I just say, okay, maybe it's just uniform between one and three just to model some kind of randomness. Next, we have the exponential family here. So we have the x is an exponential lambda random variable if it has the following PDF. So the PDF is lambda e to the minus lambda x for x greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. So it's always non-negative. The CDF I can just get by taking the integral and I'll get one minus e to the minus lambda to x. And so it just goes up like this, okay? So, you know, it's maybe easier to visualize these, to look at the PDF and the CDF. And this is nice just because it has this exponential form. The mean is something you could calculate with an integral. It turns out to be one over lambda and the variance is one over lambda squared. And the interpretation, you can think of this as a continuous version of a geometric random variable, where if you remember in that discrete case, we were waiting for the first success. So this is like a memoryless uh, way of waiting for the first thing to happen in a continuous random variable. So we're waiting for the first time where something happens starting at zero. Okay, so an application might be modeling a hard drive lifetime, okay? Or maybe it's a simple model of the infectious period of a person. And the reason I say simple is that, you know, it can go on and take any value all the way up to infinity. So that doesn't really make sense because people have finite lifetimes, but still it's a, you know, it's a nice analytically tractable model. Okay, uh, Gaussian random variable. So X is a Gaussian mu sigma squared, or this kind of script n mu sigma squared random variable, if it has the following PDF. I'm gonna write it down, and something we'll see a lot, so we'll get used to this form. So let me write it down, and then I'll read it off to you. Okay, so there's this normalization term in front, one over square root two pi sigma squared. Let's forget about that for a second. The main thing is this e to the minus x minus mu squared divided by two sigma squared. So it's basically this kind of exponential shape and this constant out front is just to make sure it normalizes out to one. So let's draw it. It just looks like this um, kind of bell curve. Okay, so it looks like a bell. All right, and it's centered at mu and it has a width that's kind of proportional to the standard deviation, which is sigma. Okay, what's the CDF? Well. A little more complicated. So the CDF we define in terms of this function capital Phi. Okay, I'm gonna draw it for you first so you can just see what it looks like. So it just looks like something that starts out at zero 
and then just keeps going up gradually. It accelerates around mu, and then it slows down again and kind of keeps creeping up towards one, only hitting one at infinity. Okay, so this, what is this function capital phi? We haven't seen this before. This turns out to be something we call the standard normal CDF. Okay, and we're gonna define it on the next page. So for now, let's just set it aside. The mean is simple, it's mu, and the variance is simple, and it's sigma squared. And these are some of the nice properties of Gaussian random variables. They're fully specified by their mean and variance. So if I tell you the mean and variance of a Gaussian random variable, you know its whole distribution. What's the interpretation? Think of it as the sum or average of many, many, many little tiny independent random quantities, okay? So that's one way of kind of thinking about this in your head. And what are some applications? Well, we often use this for modeling noise because noise you can think of as the contribution of many, many little effects that add up to something that's maybe interfering with our signal. We use them a lot in linear systems. We'll see why in a bit. And also in high, you know, for modeling high dimensional data. And this is not a high dimensional um, random variable, it's just a scalar, but we're gonna see how it extends to high dimensions in a later video. Okay, so let's get back to this issue of the um, CDF. So what is this capital phi function? Well, let me try to give you some motivation. So the problem here is that the Gaussian CDF cannot be expressed in closed form. Well, what, what is closed form? Maybe you've heard this expression somewhere. And one way to define this term is to say that it's a formula that consists of a finite number of so-called basic operations like plus and minus and multiplying and dividing, and also things like sine, cosine, exponential, log, taking you know, something to the power of n. So just things that we've already seen in high school and earlier. Okay, so this seems like something we want, right? So it seems like we need this in order to have the solution to our problem, right? But a closed form expression usually also requires a calculator to evaluate. And what I mean by that is what is the sign of two? Not two pi, but just two. That's not something that you can work out quickly in your head. You probably need to plug it into a calculator or into a computer. So even when we have a closed form expression, we usually rely on some basic computing device to work it out. Okay, so what's the point of a closed form expression? Well, it's nice to look at, but it actually um, comes from a previous era, okay? So the main thing we should keep in mind is since we're fine with using a calculator, we should also be fine with some basic numerical integration, right? So the calculator is running some algorithm to work out sine two. It would also work out some little algorithm to do numerical integration, right? And so we should really actually be satisfied with any mathematical expression we can come up with that we can evaluate quickly with some kind of um, efficient algorithm. So if I have an algorithm, maybe I don't even know how it works. I just kind of know that there's an algorithm sitting out there that will spit out answers for what this function value is, I should be happy with that, right? And so where does this idea of a closed form answer come from? Well, it comes from even before calculators. It's from the historical reliance on pre-computed tables. And that was before we actually had electronic computers, okay? So as an example, if you were a scientist working back in the day, maybe what you would have is a logarithm table, okay? So that's this thing on the left here. So someone, a computer, you know, so a human being, a human computer, had worked out some uh, table of logarithms for you to use. So it's nice to express your solutions in terms of things for which you could look up the answer in a table. And people started to get frustrated with errors that crept into these tables due to not actually necessarily uh, human computation, but the, um, let's say when you send it to the typesetter to be printed into a book, that some of the characters would get out of place. So the printer would actually misplace different numbers and that would lead to errors and that would lead to mistakes in scientific works. So um, people like Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace started to think about and build devices like the difference engine. So this was a mechanical computer that could print out its answers. So it was trying to take humans out of the loop. It would both compute things like logarithms, right? and it would immediately print out the answers onto some kind of paper. So it just took out all the possibilities of mistakes. And this is actually the origins of modern computing. Okay, so since we have modern computing, we shouldn't worry too much about sticking to closed form expressions, which is really something that's still hanging around with us from the pre-computing era. All right, pre-electronic computing. Okay, with that little bit of history aside, 
I don't usually do history in these lectures, but just I thought that one was particularly interesting. Uh, let's get back to this idea of the standard normal CDF. So this capital phi function. All it is is the CDF of a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so specifically you take phi and you set it equal to the CDF, which you get by integrating the PDF of a Gaussian. Okay, so I have my Gaussian here. Sigma squared was one, so it doesn't show up here. And the mean was zero, so that doesn't show up. So I have a simpler function here and I'm just integrating it from minus infinity to Z. What does that look like visually? So visually I write down my PDF, I sketch it, okay? And I have some algorithm that can integrate up to the value Z and that is phi of Z. And you can get this using a lookup table. Most probability books uh, have some kind of lookup table. You could also use MATLAB, Wolfram Alpha, basically anything you can think of, you can get values for this standard normal CDF. Okay, some of them we can just infer by uh, basic properties. So by symmetry, we have that five zero is a half, right? So once you've gone an integrated halfway across this symmetric Gaussian distribution, you should get a half. And since it's symmetric, if you have five minus Z, you should get one minus phi Z. We'll see more of that here, right? So if I have the area one minus phi z, that should be the area of phi minus z, right? So those are both the same, all right? So I can just see that from this picture. Okay, so I can use that to do a couple of simple um, things. But uh, the other thing I have to keep in mind is that for large values of z, it's actually kind of annoying to track this in a table and people usually work with the complement. So the standard normal complementary CDF, which we call Q of z. Okay, and that's just one minus phi of z, which we learned is phi of minus z, right? So why do I need to do this? Because as z gets very, very large, then this answer for phi of z will get very, very close to one. And it's annoying to write down things like 0.999999997, right? It's easier to write something which would be the complement. So maybe I would write two times 10 to the negative seven, right? So that's an easier thing to think about, which is what I would see integrating from z on outward. So if I want to work out the probability of an interval for a Gaussian random variable, I actually can't um, do anything but use the phi function. And it turns out to be this simple difference of CDFs. Okay, so all I'm doing is plugging in to the CDF in two different ways. So I'm plugging in the value b minus mu over sigma and plugging in the value a minus mu over sigma if I want the probability of x landing between a and b. Okay, so that's a formula that will be useful for us um, later on. Well, okay, let's play around with these Gaussian random variables. These are kind of the trick here of the three um, families that we introduced. So let's do an example. Okay, so for my example, I'm going to have a Gaussian random variable. And let's say that I take the mean to be two and the variance to be nine. And what I wanna know is the probability that X is greater than five, okay? And remember, we started using this shorthand and the shorthand is for the event that x is greater than five, which really refers back to the original um, sample space and the outcomes. But let's just stick with this shorthand because it's convenient and we already spent a lot of time learning about that framework. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take the uh, complement of this and convert it to one minus the probability of x being less than or equal to five. And now I see that this is one minus the CDF at five, okay? And the CDF at five is something that I have to go into this phi function to figure out. And the way I go into the phi function is I'm gonna plug in the value that I want, five, subtract the mean, two, and divide by the square root of the variance, square root of nine. So it's one minus phi over three over three, okay? So that's nice. So finally, and I designed the example to do this, I get one minus phi of one, I use a lookup table. I see that that's one minus 0.8413 approximately. So it's 0.1587, okay? So that's my approximate answer. It would be fine to leave it in this one minus capital phi form if I wanted to leave it in the precise form, but usually it's useful to have this approximation so we can get a, you know, a intuition for how big this number is. Okay, let's do another calculation. So let's say I know that X is gonna be greater than five, but I wanna know um, something else. So I wanna know what is the probability that X is less than eight, given that I already know it's gonna be greater than five. So it's a conditional probability question. And this is shorthand for the event version of this, 
right? So really I'm thinking about the set of things for which x is less than eight, condition on the set of things where x is less than or greater than five. And so this first thing is event A, and the second thing is event B, and we can go directly to the definition of conditional probability. So saying that this is the conditional probability of A given B. So I should be taking from the definition, I should have the probability of the intersection of A and B divided by the probability of B, okay? This is exactly the definition of conditional probability. And as we've been saying for a long time, anytime you're confused with the conditional probability question, just go right back to the definition. Okay. So now we're just going to go and plug in for what these events are. So I'm going to say for the intersection of A and B, that means you have to be both greater than 5 and less than 8. And for B, you have to be greater than 5. So now I'm just going to plug in. For the top, I use probability of an interval. So I plug in 8 minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And then I have 5 minus the mean 2 divided by the standard deviation. And I'm just going to leave the bottom as is. Okay. So I'm going to simplify both of these fractions. So I'm going to have 6 over 3 for the first one. And then I'm going to have 3 over 3 for the second one. And I'm going to still leave the denominator untouched. And finally, I'm going to have here uh, phi of 2 minus phi of 1, which is going to be 1 minus phi 1. Okay, and going to a lookup table. So, and what, okay, the denominator I just got because I'd already calculated it. Going to the lookup table, I just get 0.9772 minus 0.8413, which we looked up before, divided by what I worked up before, 0.1587. So it's 0.8563. So that's my answer. Okay, and that is it for uh, families of continuous random variables. This Gaussian random variable, we're going to be seeing a lot of it. So we're going to have a lot of practice with it. We're going to see it in many different contexts. So don't think of this as the only exposure you're going to get to it, but just the start of our experience playing around with this very important random variable.